see where we're up at. Uh... So, but does that Farron Road get you above some of the haze on the, near the ocean, or it's about equal with the haze? It's uh, you know, you're, so if you're looking elevation above zero, it, it works pretty well, and you're you're you know, you still have the lights of Goleta off to your left as you're looking out toward the ocean, but uh, it's you know, it's only a, a 20 mile trip, uh, round trip total. And whereas going to Farron Road is about, I don't know, 40 miles one way. Not Farron Road, I mean to AC, uh, West Camino, Cielo. Right. That's a little bit of a drive. Well, it's also, there's a bunch of idiots on the road. They, uh, more than twice, I, you know, going up, you come around a corner and here's somebody taking their half of the road out of the middle. Yeah, I've never hit anybody, but you know, because you're not going fast. But uh, you know, I I honk my horn when I'm coming up to a blind turn and let try people know, hey, somebody's around here. Yeah, it's so, a good idea. Well, especially how fast you drive going 60 miles an hour up there, and probably. Oh, I think it goes six miles an hour. <laughs> hey, little speed demon, Bruce. <laughs> so Joseph, uh, good to see you. Um, I'm Hello. trying to think. You, you sent an email. You're down in Carpinteria, is that right? Yes, that's right. And you had a, a scope that you were looking to get going that had been in a box for a while. Is that the one? Yes, unfortunately, that's the one. Yes, I'm the one. Well, you should have some priority uh, tonight then to try to get you going with our experts here. So you had a, a, a C11 on a, uh, and a, what kind of mount was that on? It's, it's on a um, CGM DX computerized mount. CGM, yeah. That's, so, that's the, uh, what comes with yeah. it. That's probably like one of the mounts you have, Tom, or that I have. I have the CGX, a newer mount that's okay. that I'm having terrible problems trying to get tracking. I haven't really, I need to try to auto guide him, but I think the mount itself is has a lot of problems. People have had a lot of problems with the Celestron stuff. People send them in for hyper tuning all the time because Celestron is not doing a, a very good quality control. But uh, I, Joseph, you also have an AVX mount too, right? A Celestron AVX? Yes, I do. I have the yeah the AVX that I just purchased a year ago. Um, the uh, I, I've been taking a medication that um, interferes with my my memory, so it's been really hard for me to to uh, keep track of all the directions in the instruction books and how to run these things. Uh, I don't. Well, I'm also very old, so that's probably the main reason I'm having trouble keeping things, keeping track. No, of things. you're not but... old. <laughs> you're old last year. <laughs> I think you're probably one of the younger people in the club. <laughs> but I hope not. <laughs> I, I, I'm 68 years old. Uh, Bruce, how old are you? I'm 80, and uh, Bob is uh, what 83, 82. Oh well. I am younger. I mean, it's full uh, 74. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how old is Jerry? I, Jerry and I are similar ages, aren't we? How old is Jerry? Do you know how old Jerry is? Jerry's probably 75 or 76. So I'm, the old, I'm the old man in the group, right? Yeah, at this point. Well, let's yeah, hope it stays man. that way. <laughs> Say that I stay an old man? <laughs> no, that you stay in the group. Stay in the group, okay. I like stay, that, Bruce. I'll I like stay in, that, stay in that old man. <laughs> I know Art, Art Harris is, is up there somewhere too. He's at least he's 80, 80 probably 85 now. Is that he right? was 84. Wow. wow. But, but well, Joseph, I have a, I have a Celestron AVX. I, and I remember I sent you an email suggesting a checklist, making some sort of. Yes, you did. I appreciate that. And I, I, I actually have my notebook in front of me and that's exactly what I wrote down make a detailed checklist of all the steps needed I mean and, uh, uh, that 
that applies to me oftentimes I forget steps in fact I remember time not not putting the weights on uh, to balance the scope and then loosening the clutch and grabbing the scope as it spun around you know so <laughs> there's certain steps you shouldn't forget yeah yeah um I, I I wrote back to you thanking you for your um I don't did you get that thanking you for your email I'm, I'm I'm just looking for emails here did you write it to the webmaster or was it to Tom says um I well I, I wrote to um I don't know I guess I don't know who's who I wrote back it must be, it must be Tom says I assume and I've I, lost I wrote, track I, of that to Jerry also. Tom says at Gmail. Oh, there you are. Oh, yeah. You know, I just saw it. You just, uh, yeah, September 29th. Oh, no, yeah. that's, a, that's the one I wrote to you. I, I don't remember seeing the reply. Well, I, I just wrote back a thank you and that I got um, another email from, I guess, Tom says. That's me. That's you. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, then I, I wonder if I sent it to. I guess I got. Oh, no, I, I got it. I got it. I think. Well, no, that's me. <laughs> I keep. I keep seeing my email. I. 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 I CC myself when I when I write something, so it ends up in my inbox. I don't. Yeah, I don't see the reply one from from you. Oh, okay. Um, the I wonder if I. It seems like I got something from a Tom Totten as well. That's me. That's me. Yeah. That's you. So who's Tom Says? That's me as as well. That's my oh, my okay. wife's name is Saison. He has he has multiple identities. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm glad Tom he doesn't have multiple personalities. That would be bad. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to um, look at my email here, and um, yeah, it was on, on September 29th is when I sent you the email suggesting a, a checklist, a de detailed checklist, and don't know what, if you did anything past that. Look for YouTube videos on how to run the mounts. Sometimes yeah, they sometimes they work. That's what what was it? What were the two mounts that you had? You said you had a CG, CGM, CGEM DX. Um, That's the and you've got another one. The other one is an advanced VX. It's a smaller one. Oh, us. okay. They're both uh, Celestron mounts then. Yes. All right. Yes. So they use the same software basically. Yeah, the CGM DX was a the fancy one before the. CGM series, uh, CGX series rather. And we had one of those and got sold off, but by the time it made it to the customer, it was broken and uh, Paul got a refund from the shipping company, but then that money disappeared and F when Paul died. So that was a failure. <laughs> it, it, can't remember, we used to have, I can't remember what scope we had on that uh, size, like a, a, like a 10 inch or something. Uh, there's a whole users group for those things as well somewhere. They do still show it in Celestron products. I don't I wouldn't think the CGM DX would would still be. Oh, okay, maybe this is not that old amount. I, maybe well, I'm wrong. Oh, okay, the, C, the CGM is actually it's it's like a step up from the AVX. It's actually a two thousand dollar mount. It shows here. The CGM. I could uh, show the, uh, is it, tell, Joe, see, is this the one we're talking about? It looks looks like it, except mine's older than that. It's Mine older. Doesn't have, doesn't have that pretty orange circle on it. Yeah, so this, I wonder. This one's 10 years old, but yeah, yeah. it's the same, same yeah. one. Yeah, this is newer version, yeah. So you... But you have a CGM DX. I wonder what the, uh, the 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 older ones looked like. Let's see. Um, support. 
Yeah, I had that older one on my nine and a quarter inch Celestron. Oh, you did? Yeah. I, I want to, when we get done here, I'll comment on uh, Celestron mounts. Yeah, so they, I don't know if they have support uh, for the older version somewhere. As I recall, it was just simply CGEM. Yeah, without the DX. Yeah, right. Well, this is the. This is this, this is, is not the, the right kind of. Support. It came with it. CG. Oh, bring yeah, bring that up close. Can you bring up that closer? Um, or show it to. Uh, that, oh. Tom, can you show that? Yeah. Let me stop share here, and let me look at. Let me look uh, at it. Joe, yeah. Joe, start talking a little bit. Um. That that's the um, book that came with it. Okay, Joe, put that put that book back up again. Yeah, let's take a look at that. I can tell. Lift it up a little bit. Can't see the mounting. Up a little further, a little further. Up a little more, a little more. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, that's the mounting I had. Okay. On a nine and a quarter inch. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Um, well, well yeah, I, I, just, I, I, I just remember the C gem this, without the DX. I didn't know there was a DX version of that. Yeah. I think they made it uh, to have a higher load capacity. It says 55 uh, pounds. Joseph, I, my experience with that mounting, it was really, it was problematic. Uh, it, 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 um, it didn't align well. It didn't keep its alignment. It didn't track really well, and uh, it was just frustrating. And I, uh, I thought that maybe there was something wrong with the the control paddle. I, so I replaced that. And then they were telling me, oh well, you probably got uh, problems, things in the gear. You have to take it down, and have it clean. Well, it was I hardly used it. I thought, wait a minute. So it. It it was, it was frustrating to use. So finally, I said I'm not going to mess with Celestron anymore, and I got an iopton. What a difference! I mean, just totally different. Uh, quiet, it works every smoother. time. Yeah, and it tracks really well. I got the, this is an older version uh, iopton that's into its IEQ 45. They don't make it anymore, but um, they 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 make ones that will. Um, I have also I also have a C11. It's a Edge, and it's right now in an Ioptron C uh, Ioptron GEM60. So it will hold uh, up to 60 pounds of of gross weight, and that is such a superior mounting to the Celestron. Um, I think I do I agree with uh, Tom. I, Celestron is. It does not make good quality mountings at this point. You know, I haven't so, heard good news about Celestron from almost anybody. Everybody says the same story. I wound up, uh, I wound up uh, hyper tuning my uh, C gem. In the beginning, I, I tried to use the eight inch for imaging, um, and it was so the tracking was so bad that it. It, I couldn't track with it. And so I took it apart and you, you basically, what you do is you take the whole mount apart, start polishing certain parts of the gears and adjusting the alignment of the worms properly to the uh, ring gear. And um, by the time I did that, it actually was uh, tracking well enough to, um, was, was tracking well enough to take uh, astrophotography with a C8. But that means taking the whole mount apart and, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, basically polishing and, and hyper tuning. Well, it's basically, it's hyper tuning, um, but it, the hyper tune did work. Uh, How long did that take you, Mike? A long time. Yeah. Because, well, because, um, 
I had this room where they had this big desk and I had it there and, you know, I was making my mirror with you guys. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it wasn't, it wasn't a priority. So um, I'd say it, I, I say it took me about two months to do. Yeah. Um, if somebody was do to do it in earnest, it would probably take about a, a week or so, but I kept looking at the videos and, you know, uh, sort of like staging and all that. And it went very well. Um, but the thing, the fact that the matter is um, that, uh, you know, um, I got the Mizu in the meantime. <laughs> so <laughs> it became... I, a, you know, Tom, what, Tom Whittemore had a problem with the mountain. He ended up getting an Ioptron too, Bob. And it and he he really liked it. He said it did sound a little bit like a coffee grinder, but it worked great. Much lighter oh, really? load, load though. That's interesting. Yeah, because my I, both ioptrons I've had when it would slew, it was much quieter than than the Celestron. The Celestron to me sounded like a grinder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very loud. Yeah. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like Celestron's a way to go on mounts now. It just doesn't sound right. Well, well Tom, out, sir, mate. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Tom, on that email that you don't have that I just wrote, I think, yesterday to you, I also added that back about, well, in 2000, my wife bought me a um, Celestron Nexstar 8-inch telescope. And I could never get that to work. And it, and it even went back to Celestron for a year before, before I got it back. Wow. And I couldn't get it to work. So that, that telescope um, never provided anything for me. So um, I don't know what prompted me to go ahead and get a C11 when I was such a rank amateur. I guess because I was working two jobs at the time and I felt a little flush with money. but. Um, it's um, I, the, the news that are people talking about it, but having these things difficult to work is a little um, daunting at the moment. I, I don't think I'll be able to take my mount apart and polish it and put it all together. Well, well first of all, you, you got to learn, um, got to make sure that you know how to that that you remember how to use the mount and and set it up properly to get the basic operation going um if if you haven't done that yet then you need to 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 learn um especially um polar alignment um i don't know i'm gonna say the same thing yeah um okay. polar alignment and alignment of the tripod making it level is very important for these go-to scopes. Um, once well, the level doesn't matter. The level is just uh, uh, makes it very easy from one setup to the next to once you get north aligned, it pretty much works because you're taking out the, uh, the tilt of the scope when you do the, the, uh, the star alignment, three, you, two or three star alignment. You, you do, but if it's off a little bit and it tells you that you need to turn it in azimuth, you might change the altitude a little bit as you do that um, oh i see yeah yeah uh so the the, the 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 initial thing is if you have an iphone or android use the level feature on it put it on the tripod get that set up first before you do anything yeah. um and then um uh try and dial in the north pole uh start now do you have a a polar alignment uh, scope with it or not? No. Okay. That's important. Well, you know, let, yeah, let me interrupt yeah. there. On, on the Celestrons, there's a thing called polar alignment. Yeah. And, and first you can do a, a you know, three star alignment. But then if you go to polar alignment, you find a star that's off the meridian somewhat. And that is generally can work pretty well to get you right on, on true north. It's really helps mm -hmm. to get it going. Although I just recently had a problem with my CGX mount trying to complete a polar alignment. It didn't seem to want to get the star in the center. So that was frustrating again on the CGX. But 
that I think that polar alignment function is really, really good, at least on the celestrons to get you right on. So look for that, Joe, in your in your documentation about polar alignment and and try to follow along with that. I did um, see that. Yes, I was. I, I, I saw that even though I didn't have a, a polar scope, it did talk about the polar alignment. It's, yeah, it's I use that also in my uh, CGM. I use the same thing that Tom's talking about, and it does work. It's not as great as uh, like the ioptron has polar scope, and boy, you can get really precise with that. Same so, thing with the Orion stuff. Yeah. But the thing is so, that uh, mm -hmm. probably for most go to, that would be sufficient um, if he's not. Um, Joe, you, you're you're not going to be doing astrophotography, are you? No. Okay, so visually, you can yeah, get away with it fine. a bit more. And then another thing too is, I believe the C gem has a a sync function where you can uh, align on a a particular object and then go to your next one. And if it if it's off, go back to a, an object or a star that's close to it and resync and go back to the object you want to find a lot mm -hmm. of times that'll help you get to where you you need to be and can compensate for some of the uh, inaccuracies and the uh yeah. the slewing uh, okay. another thing too is if you haven't used them out for a long time and I, i'm not sure about the electronics inside but some of these mounts use the battery to remember the time and or your location. And that can be important for alignment. So one of the things that, um, one of the things that you, you gotta do is figure out whether, um, if there's a battery in there and, and if it's good. If it isn't, it just means that you have to manually enter things like the time and your, and your latitude and longitude. So one of the things you should bring with you is a little card or something like that uh, of your home address with the latitude and longitude from Google Maps or whatever, so yeah. that when you do set things up, it'll know what the location is. Okay. Yeah, but if you set up remotely with your home address and you're not at home, that's not that's true. Work. That's <laughs> true. Then then you just find your location with a GPS. Now, is that because you're trying to find uh, true north and every location has a different deviation? It does. It has a, it has a latitude and a longitude difference. Okay. Hmm. Hey, Joseph. I don't know uh, what the ours in Santa Barbara is. It's something like 14 or 15 degrees between magnetic and true north. Oh, yeah. That's 14, yeah. 14, okay. Uh, Joseph, I was wondering... Are there um, are there any amateurs around? Are you down in Carpinteria? Is that yeah. where are you? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Probably it would be really helpful if someone could come down and and help you with this, particularly since you're having some uh, trouble uh, sequencing. Uh, you know, maybe somebody from the club can come down and. See, I'm I'm not in Santa Barbara. I'm in Arizona. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Oh. Uh, but I used to I used to be in Santa Barbara. I used to live in Santa Barbara. I was in this club for many many years. But uh, if someone could come and and help you with that, I think that would be immensely valuable and uh, really determine what's um, what you're doing that's not getting things going and correct that and then if you're still having trouble with the mount then you may have a real problem with the mounting now, it's hard to know now how much is what you're bringing to it and how much is the mounting is uh, not functioning correctly and and joe going back to if you're just doing visual you should not have much of a problem with alignment and things it, it you're tracking you can bump it with your hand controller so if you're just if you're not trying to do astrophotography here, it's a big, big difference that way. You're not trying to hold something steady for a minute at a time. And so if it drifts across your field of view, it, it, you, you won't, that's, that's not a big deal. You, you should be able to get by pretty well with your, with your units. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter, I think, of getting used to your hand controller for the Celestron mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and and they should both be similar to each other and kind of make, get like you say, have a checklist that you put everything together properly and do the basic uh, alignment and i think you'll be okay so, <laughs> oh one important thing joe are you using a crosshair alignment eyepiece in other words it's a it's an eyepiece with an illuminated reticle in there. Um, let me explain something to the rest of you gentlemen that I think only Tom knows about. Um, I, I purchased this telescope a little over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It has not ever been out. It has no first light. <laughs> um, it, I have a cross piece um, eyepiece for that, but I've never been able to get it set up. We lived in Portland before and the scope was way too heavy for me to take anywhere. And um, then we moved to Carpinteria a couple of years ago. It's been boxed until just recently. But now my problem is that I wrote to Tom about, or Jerry about a bit, but, but initially was that I, I'm having difficulty trying to understand the directions there in, in the, um, in the guidebook, in the instruction manual, the, um, and I don't know if that's a medical issue with me. Like I said, I, I, I take a medicine that really interferes with my short-term memory, or if I just haven't sat down and, and, um, studied it long enough to really make a difference but it i haven't used it at all um the mount and the tripod are out on my my patio in the backyard which faces north unfortunately the um and it's covered well it's protected but um the telescope's not even ever been on it and I'm, I'm having difficulty trying to understand its use. So, so I went to YouTube looking for videos to try to clarify or simplify what's going on. And I've been unable to find a, a YouTube video that really explains how to operate the mount in the simplest of ways. And I'm just looking for the simplest of way to to try to look for something. I've been out of practice so long, I don't know if I can even star no. hop anymore. Can I, can I ask you what scope are you using and what mount? Is this this next star? I said I, I had an old next star, but it never worked. Okay. So, so I, don't, I, I just don't know what scope you're referring to. I was, I, I got here late. He's uh, got a C11, C11. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the last telescope I used was was a Vixen little um, mm. um, four inch uh, reflector that has no automatic mount. It's just an AZ mount that I could use from my porch in Portland and, and look at a few planets. But that that has a, a very high um, focal length and you mean the vixen mount that was it had it was an altaz mount or it was a pole, uh, german equatorial altaz mount altaz okay yeah and um so now, i don't have very little telescope experience most now, of my experience has been at astronomy club meetings out of portland a number of years ago where i could look through other people's telescopes but I was never able to get my C8 to work, even though I tried it many times. And uh, so I, I just retired that. And then I- um, Question, you still have the C8? Yeah, I still have the C8. Okay, now you find that the C11 is a little bit daunting to put on your C gem mount, is that correct? Well, I haven't even tried yet. Okay, so in other words, you're trying to figure out the mount without a telescope on there. Is that what you're trying to do? Yes, I was trying to figure out just how the mount works. I mean, I can put the C8 on it. Um, I understand maybe that's what you're getting at. Yes. The, um, 
the uh, but I the problem I ran into that got me so discouraged is that when I went to the instruction manuals to try to figure out exactly what it is I do, I was getting myself lost. And so I was wishing for somebody who could either recommend a, an equatorial mount for dummies book or, or um, s some format where it's just sort of easy to understand. You know, but in my experience, you know, I don't have the, I don't have any uh, experience with like the, you know, the C8s, the C11s. I don't have any with the Schmidt Cassegrains. I don't have any experience with those mounts. But I can tell you that going through something and going through an instruction book uh, is very daunting because you don't, they, they can, they can be confusing uh, just even, even if they're really, really explaining it well, they can still be excuse, just really confusing. So sometimes it, it would be really good to uh, uh, pick out the areas of the, of the instruction manual that are really confusing, bring them to a workshop so that we can hear it and then we can actually say, oh, oh, this is what we can do. Because, you know, I can see how you'd be confused and it doesn't, it's, it's and on top of it all, some of the instruction booklets, they're written by completely different people that made the telescope. And that's, that's a whole nother layer of confusion. Well, they were written in Chinese and then translated. <laughs> that's right. I got one that was written in Japanese and it was not translated. Yeah, I have a, oh, I, have a go, <laughs> I have a Takahashi mountain. You know, I, they're, the Takahashi mountain I have is really well made. It's well constructed. And, and the, the instruction booklet, I went over it about 50 times and still didn't get it. And then just kind of fumbling around and doing it, it's, I made a lot of mistakes with it. And, and, and before I actually got an idea of what I was doing, I haven't taken it out in a long time either. But, but uh, yeah, I can, I can see that, how, how that, would, that would happen for you. Oh, I think understanding, I appreciate that. Makes me feel a lot less stupid. No, the, the, the one thing that in the workshop and every, every time we go out into the, the public the outreach and people have questions like this, I always tell people right off the bat, hey, there's no, there's no stupid questions here. There just aren't. You know, the, 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 this, this stuff, this stuff may, may be really daunting, but you know what, you never get anywhere unless you really ask. And, it, and, and it, it's, not, it's not dumb at all, Joe, it's just not. It's, it's, uh, it's something that I think that if you went through it and, and if somebody could come down there and do it, I, I probably wouldn't be able to help. I'm not good with the, with the uh, that C gem mount, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so Jim, Jim, here here is a YouTube video, and okay. it's called how to how to set up a C gem equatorial mount in 15 minutes. So looks like he went through a lot of uh, mechanical setup, and now he's getting to the hand controller, which is the most difficult part. And okay. you know, and that's where you have to. It is confusing unless you do it enough to get used to uh, pressing the right buttons at the right time. And knowing that you can the, the scroll up and down arrows are ways to get through the menus and things. So it, it is it is tough to to get used to in the beginning unless you do it often enough. That's right. And sometimes I even wish I, I should make a checklist, but I, I generally figure out what to do over a few tries. But uh, so I, I assume this is pretty close to what you might have, Joe. What do you think? Yeah, that's exactly the same um, um, control piece that I have there. But yeah, what I saw in the YouTube videos I looked at is they just basically told you how to set it up on the tripod and put the telescope on it. And then that was it. It wasn't much of on, on how to use it. Yeah. Um, but maybe yeah. this one, maybe this one does. Yeah, that's where the hand you know, I have a, I have Orion mounts. I have a, both the Skyview Pro. In fact, I got two of them. And I have the Atlas Pro. The Atlas Pro has got encoders in it. It's belt drive. It's silent. And it really works well. But all of them were fine. And uh, the with a pen, you get a hook on the mount. It typically says the same thing you're talking about. How to put it together, how do you mount stuff, blah, blah, blah. But then they have another separate book on the hand controllers. And it's very detailed. It walks you through everything. And their software is such that um, 
turn them out on and it, it you know it there's some it says don't look at the sun and there's some warnings that you got you just go through them yeah. and then finally it's going to ask you uh your latitude longitude time of day elevation um and stuff like that and you just oh, it it Tom. right through it you just walk right through it then finally says do you want to oh then it'll then it finally comes up and tells you where mm -hmm. the Polaris should appear in the reticle on the polar scope. There's a clock face in there. So it tells you the time that you should put it. And you put it there. And one of the things that I do that really helps me getting aligned is I have made, uh, you know, on the lathe, uh, aluminum things that allow me to take my laser pointer and put it onto the polar scope. So it points in the sky exactly where it's looking. So it's really easy just to move the scope around until the laser is pointing at Polaris. And then when I look in the polar scope, yeah, it's pretty much is right there. And then I use the hand controller to get it centered or get it put it where they tell me to put it. And then you go through, a, it gives you a choice of one, two or three star alignment. I generally two, choose two stars and you do the two star alignment. It comes back and tells you how well you got aligned. And I generally get aligned within like four minutes of arc. And I've done many uh, one, two, three, five minute exposures unguided. Oh, guided, but you know, no, no, no star tracking, and they come out just fine. So um, there, there may be another book uh, for your uh, the, for the controller that has all of this this nitty gritty detail about what you do. If I can make a suggestion, um, uh, hold 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 it there, uh, Tim. Okay. Um yeah. That's a picture of the uh, the controller. And one of the things that you need to do this, to set things up is the lower left one is called the menu button. Uh -oh. Right. Okay, that will get you into a bunch of entries that will be shown on the display. And then you use your up and down button right there. Yeah, those two yeah. to scroll through it. And so what you need to do is you need to go and set up your uh, location information and make sure time, because you said that this has been around, you've had this for 10 years, okay? So it's quite possible what is happening is um, either there's a, a NICAD battery in there that has run down or yeah, a battery. button battery that has um, um, expired and you need to go in there and change it so that it can remember the time. But when you still can use it with the, with a dead battery, you just have to remember to enter your, your time and location into the uh, telescope mount. And in the manual, there is an, actually a diagram. It's like a flow diagram that shows you all the menus. It's it's at the very end, I believe, of the manual. Yeah, I, I yeah, right there. See, scope setup, and so um, this will tell you what you need to do as far as um, you know. The first one right there is set up the time, okay, and sight. Okay, I would not worry about backlash because um, you're visual. Um, um, I would go to, let's see here, auto guide, OTA orientation. Most of that is, um, most of that is not, uh, much of anything that you would be, um, um, would be too concerned about because you're, you're not doing photographic stuff. You're doing, um, you're, you're, you're doing visual. So um, what I would do is I would put that C8 on there because it's a smaller scope. It's less intimidating. Get a wide field eyepiece and your, um, your uh, crosshair eyepiece, okay? Make sure the battery's good in it and go through some of the, the, the calibration routines. Um, Another thing too is, even though you don't have a polar scope, what you could do is um, look, um, usually what happens is that you 
if you turn the tube 90 degrees on the declination axis, if you take a look in, in the mount on the deck axis, there's a hole in the, in, in the shaft. And what I would do is I would turn it such that you could see the hole there and mm -hmm. just look through it and kind of like eyeball it to the North Pole star. Yeah, right there. As a matter of fact, what you might do is put in a piece of plastic pipe that's like about one or two feet long mm -hmm. through there and just kind of like eyeball it to the North Pole star and that should get you fairly close to where you need to be, okay? And then what you could do is then go through your polar alignment routine um, after you take the plastic pipe out because it'll probably break it off inside. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no it will break it off inside yeah. something and will break and, and don't stick your finger in the tube because it's a wonderful sharp shear you know it's called a guillotine <laughs> that's right <laughs> okay so they you know in this case here they've got this accessory called the the gps sync and um a lot of times that'll operate with the mount and give you your time and your location Okay, um, I'm not sure if it works with yours, but you know. it, it's funny, uh, Mike. I have a, one of those sync uh, GPS things on my CGM scope. Oops. And DNH customers for 30 years. Oops. Got a TV on somewhere. Yeah, it was me. I opened up a, uh, a video without meaning to. You got to hit the mute. Yeah. Yeah. It, anyway, so I have one of these GPS things on my CG, uh, CGX mount, and it was showing the the wrong it was off by an hour it wasn't it wasn't corresponding to daylight savings that were still on it was uh, it was showing standard time and it wouldn't uh, so it was kind of useless in that way it was off an hour I had to go and manually put the time in but uh, but okay but with the re respect to the um time you know it's it just use your your watch or your or your phone you know usually that's pretty accurate and the location with Google Maps yeah. Yeah. Put it in there. And that yeah, should, for, should... for visual use, Joe should be just, he just needs to get the setup and get the basic uh, hand control yeah. uh, things set up okay. and, and do know, get to know the sky stars. Uh, yeah, but this diagram is very important because you can see where they talk about alignment stars and all that. And I can go through the, the, the I'm, I'm beginning to remember it because I've, I've got this mount. Um, the basically, once you got it pretty close to the North Pole star, you can, what you do is you go through the alignment star, okay, you press alignment star there, it's one of the top three buttons, and right. it'll tell you, it'll suggest the star to, to, to slew to. Now, you may have to tell it, no, I don't like this star, and um, you, there's buttons on the side that you can go to different stars. So yeah, if you, you have a tree, it, if you have a tree in the way or something, you might want to choose a different star. So you yeah. go to the first star, and then um, <laughs> if you go to the hand thing, there is, um, it's got a, it, it 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 slews fast when you go to the first alignment star, and then what you hit is, uh, if you if you can go back to the hand control, I can go through the. The process oh, it's fairly let's, let's it's not see, too okay. bad okay 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 you, you've got the you go to the the center one's called enter okay once that once you do that it should be tracking uh sort of and then what it does is that it slows down the slew rate okay so that you can use your higher power eyepiece or your crosshair eyepiece what what i would do is the the first star, I put my wide angle eye, um, eyepiece in there to get, um, get because it's not going to be very accurate at all. You get it as to where it looks like it's centered. You take that eyepiece out. You put the crosshair eyepiece in. You get it centered. You hit the, the enter. Okay. And then what you do is um, you go to the next, um, you, you center it. Uh, more carefully um, to get it exactly in the center of the crosshair, okay? At that time, the slew rate will be much less. And then you hit the align when it's proper. 
Now, sometimes what will happen is you won't be tracking, but you'll be close enough where the, the star starts trailing through the crosshairs. And what you do is you hit the align button right after, right when it goes through the crosshairs. Okay. Okay. And then it should, it should start tracking. It, it won't, um, it won't be accurate as far as go to, but what you do now is it'll say, usually it'll say second star. And so what you do now is you slew to another star, preferably uh, a distant, quite a distance away. Um, and you align on that, you go through the enter and then find a line with your crosshair and do the align. And then usually it'll say success. And um, from then you should be able to uh, do a go-to with a wide angle eyepiece, like a like a 32 millimeter or something like that, go down to about 40 power or something like that. And okay. it should be fairly accurate. After that, then what you could do if you wanna get more, um, once you get comfortable with that, you can go back to what is known as the, the polar line where it'll tell you, it'll, it'll, it'll slew to a star or tell you, go to this star, slew on it, okay. And with your crosshair eyepiece, get it exactly centered. And then you go through the align mount where, okay, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, it, it, what it'll do is it'll say, it'll tell you to hit a certain button. There's messages that, that go across the, the display. Um, they, they, they slew across it, so you have to, be careful about reading it, but it'll tell you in a, in general terms what you're supposed to do next with the button, what button the button to push, or how you're supposed to move it. It'll either tell you to slew the mount, or it in the case of polar alignment, it'll say don't hit any button, move the scale, move the scope manually with the alt azimuth um, adjustment. Um, on, on the bottom of the mount or the elevation. And okay. um, you, you go through that process. It'll, it'll actually lead you by the hand on that. And then once you do that alignment, what you do is you turn it off and go through your alignment again with your uh, star for your first star. And it should be pretty accurate after that. So, the other... so, the, so, so the first things first, put in your latitude, longitude, and your time, align on your first star, get it aligned, press enter, get mm -hmm. it really centered, press align, go to your next star, because it'll ask for another star, go through a, a rough centering, and then um, when you hit enter, you go. You then go into a, a fine, um, fine slew to your uh, alignment, and then you should be done. And you should be able to go through uh, the menus. And let's say if you go back to um, if you go back to the hand controller again. Okay. Um, so um, on the number on the, on the numbers. Okay, it has different things. Like on the number one, it has M. That stands for Messier objects. And so when you hit that, it'll bring up. Um, It'll, it'll bring up a little menu where you're supposed to enter two numbers, okay? Not one, two numbers. So if Actually, you're three for, numbers, Mike. You have to hit zero, three, one for Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah. Okay, I forget. It's, it's been about four years since I've used it. Okay, just remember, because otherwise- is, uh, This is it very interesting, work. but I don't use a Celestron, so I'm gonna leave Joseph in the hands of the experts. Okay. I'll, see you, I'll see you next week. Okay, hey, and I'll be able to show you my um, interferometer. I got my interferometer. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Next good week, luck, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so the, the next number is for NGC, and and the and the important thing to remember is I forget which which button you press, but um, when you when you when you find something there and this is not very clear because i can't see it 
Yeah, it's, it's a, not very clear. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, the top right button is called undo. So anytime you, okay, that gets you up to the top menu. Okay. And so when you go to, you press the, the one for Messier, okay, and you put, you know, zero, zero, one for one, okay, and you slew to it and you see it, okay, and you want to do something else. The first thing you do is you press the undo to get you back to the top. Gotcha. Okay, so you can do something else like press planets and it will, um, the, the planets when that comes up, okay, the two, um, the, the two line menu, I think will, um, yeah, it'll probably say select planet and then it'll probably have one of the planets selected. Then you use the right up and down buttons on the left, the, the, the six and the nine to select whatever planet. And so for a lot of objects, you can use that. Um, name star is another one. What's um, the select button? Is that the, is that the middle one says enter? Yeah, I believe okay. so, yeah. <clears throat> okay. It'll tell you, it'll probably tell you which button to press to select it. Okay. And, it, and, it, and it'll scroll across like, uh, you know, Times Square type of uh, thing. And that's one thing, Mike, uh, to interject right there is that the scrolling speed you can adjust under the menu and, and that right. can be important to uh, not have it go too fast. It'll be kind of jumpy. So sometimes right. you might want to slow it down to, to see it more clearly, but or you might want to speed it up because it's just too slow for you. So, okay. How do you do that? How do you do that, Tom? It's under the menu uh, yeah. system. There's one of the right. ways right. you can change that speed. OK, um, this is not a. Um, a, a clear picture. I could I could probably go back to this other one. Okay. That. Uh, okay. See if it's a clear way to go. Let's see which one was it. Don't know. Um, How am I sounding? I, I I actually got a microphone for you guys. Not not. You're not, sounding not, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got a I got a little lavalier microphone that. Uh, for thirty nine dollars at Best Buy, it's thing. It was the only inexpensive one. <laughs> so you can't. So you're not hearing my fan noise on my laptop anymore, huh? That's no. Good. Yeah, no. It's good. It's clear. Okay, good. Also, did anybody else freeze? I froze and had, and I just got bumped out of the meeting, and Tom had to let me back in again. Was that no. just on my end? No, just just you. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so well, I've, I've had happened. some trouble. Just, yeah, okay, yeah, if, in, but it's on this end. It's yeah, on my well, end. If, if you could show the manual, you get the manual, just put it on the manual. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Good point. That's okay. Okay, go to the, yeah, you can go all the way up to the Somewhere. top there. Yeah, go up to the top. Oh, that's just showing a display. There it is. There it is. Okay, yeah, there, 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 go. there, there oh, we go. Oh, okay, oh, so. Oh. To, to, yeah. to, to change your slewing um, speed, you hit the rate button and then one through nine. Yeah. Okay, nine is the fastest, one is the slowest. Usually I use between five, around five. If I'm impatient and uh, lining or, or I screw up something, I put it on nine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so you can see right there at the top is the undo, the enter and the align. Okay, so when you do an alignment, you always find your first star and hit the enter first. Okay, okay. then you get really close and then you hit your align. Now, okay. just, just remember that um, the menu button, which is the number three here in this picture, mm -hmm. okay, um, gets you in the menus where you, 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 you're under your time and your date and all that and other things like backlash and stuff like that. But to get out of it, you always press the undo. And also just remember inside the menu, you'll have other sub menus. Okay. And to get to the next, okay. You can, you can have like enter time. Okay. And an, or location. And then you go to a sub menu and it says enter latitude and enter so when you want to go back up you always hit 
the undo button to get you back up to the top. So yeah. um, um, let's see here. I think my is an older one, so the um, the menu button on mine is is uh, button number seven. Okay, that's fine. I mean, as long as you can, yeah. as long you know, it's just the just they just, really haven't yeah. radically changed this because um, I had a G, I have a GPS eleven, a CGM GPS eleven, which came out in two thousand uh one and then i got a, a c gym which was like 2004 or i mean actually 2010 the uh, the hand controllers were basically the same okay yeah. um now yeah, look was and and basically they haven't really changed things too much um the, the only thing that they've they've changed maybe is the way that you do alignment I know on the on the GPS I had that they actually use the GPS for time and a and a magnet and all that. I mean, a compass and all that. And they took that out because they got into a lawsuit with uh, Mead. And so the new ones use like two star or whatever alignment. Okay. So, um, but basically, you take a look at take it taking a look at your manual. Um, uh, and okay, so does it? Um, does does yours look like the the one in the in the large picture there? Probably not. Let me see. It's kind of because it has that logo down on the. Oh, it does. Okay. Right. Okay, so that means that it's a newer um, one, which means that actually you could update the firmware, but I wouldn't at this time. Um, until you're really okay, so you can see here. No, okay, you can see where they, they changed it a little bit, but basically it's the same. Okay, instead of the undo, they have back because people, yeah. I think that's a semantic type of thing because people go, right. what's undo? You know, well, back is, you know. Yeah. Okay, solar system, identify menu. Okay, so sky tour. Okay, so what I don't see here on the older ones is like Messi or NGC. So it's going to operate a little differently. It's under deep sky. Under deep, yeah. under oh, it deep is. Sky. Okay. Yeah. So in, in other words, under you have to sky. go through another level of menu. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You scroll up and down once you get yeah. there inside deep sky. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I guess if you're looking for a deep sky, you would press deep sky, then scroll whether you want to do NGC or M or whatever or stars or whatever hit yeah. categories enter, galaxies star yeah. clusters. and hit the enter button to select that sub menu and then it'll you'll have to scroll back up and down for the other things or you may have to enter numbers but just remember when you want to get back to where you want to do something different hit the back button until it says you're at the top menu Okay. Hey, uh, one thing I, I want to just toss out here, Joseph, uh, I mean, I think th that uh, Mike has really given you some really good information here. Um, yeah, yes. But once once you go through this and get it done, um, there's a function called sync, S-Y-N-C. Yes. And different controllers have different ways of getting to it. But what it does is, for instance, if you're out observing for several hours and you find that your pointing is getting a little bit off. So if you're, say, looking for a faint object and you, uh, you know, point, uh, you, you give the computer the command to go to this object and it doesn't appear and you find that it's, 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 it's a little off, then you go to the nearest nearby star and you get it into your finder, and then you use this sync function. What it does is that it syncs the internal computer, or it re <laughs> recalibrates the celestial globe inside the computer. It recalibrates it and makes it current. In other words, once you sync on that star, 
and you try to find the nearby faint object, it'll take you right to it. Hey, Bob. And that's, <laughs> that's a very good function. Bob, I think what I do is I, I want to add more alignment stars. You know, I'll go to a star and then I'll click on the align button and it'll ask me if I want to replace one of the alignment stars or what it wants to, or I can click on do, yeah. or up and down and, and change to a calibration star, add yeah. to a calibration star or replace the calibration star. And so that's, I think, what you're talking about, the, the syncing. Yeah, Here, here's a trick I learned, Tom, that really makes uh, alignment really fast. If, if you haven't moved your mountain, say it's sitting there, it's overnight, and you come back the next night or so and you fire it up and you hit the coordinates, whatever you're gonna look at, and, and you find it's not quite, it's not quite on it. So you just go to a nearby star, star and sink, and it has aligned everything, at least in the eastern or western part of the meridian, wherever you're going. It's very fast. I found that, boy, I can do that, just zip like that, and I'm back in business. Uh, oh, yeah. Just in one fact, time. And Bob, it, what, <laughs> yeah. what I do quite often when I start these things up is uh, you know, the sky will be pretty light and maybe have just one star that I can see in the sky. And I'll go yeah. to, uh, I'll, you know, align my scope just by, by eyeballing it to line it up with the north, what I think is the North Star. Uh, and I'll do, and I, you know, if you get used to it, you know, kind of where you're, if you're setting up in the same place, you know, approximately where you should set up. Right, right. And then do, uh, go go just hit you go into a um the align function you use, actually say just do a quick align and it, yeah, it just accepts what it is and then yeah. you then you go to a star and then click on the align button to start uh, putting in alignment uh, stars so that yeah. that's tip, typically i'll be doing that just a quick align especially for planets and and i might move the mount to uh, kick the mount tripod around so it lines up with the, with a, a bright bright star or planet just to get yeah. started <laughs> yeah well that work that works too you know and so they're, they're just things uh joe that as you get used to uh get used to this they're little short shortcuts you can use but you'll just uh you know you just gotta just go out and do it and uh, learn it and uh and you'll you know eventually you'll get the hang of it the, the first thing what i would do is i would see if I could contact Celestron and say, hey, I've not used this telescope mount in 10 years. Is there a battery do I need to replace? Yeah, that's a good okay. idea. Um, and you might be able to find that by just taking the front cover off and seeing if there's a, um, you know, uh, a, a 30, 32 or whatever button batteries inside there. You know, Mike, yeah. I've, I've never noticed that, that there's a battery in the hand controller. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up. I, I don't remember seeing that. Just uh, Some somehow of the can... do have them. Yes. I've never seen it in my hand controllers either. The hand controllers that Orion uses uh, look very, very similar to the ones that Celestron uses. The buttons are named differently, but the hand controller shape and the guts are, you know, look the same. And there's no battery inside. Okay, but you have to enter the time every time? You have to enter the time and your your latitude, longitude, elevation. Okay, and some of the and and some of the celestrons like my uh, GPS um, did have a battery in there because it 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 remembered the time. Yeah. So actually, I don't have to enter latitude and longitude. It remembers that. It, they have uh, well, then it's, volatile memory in there, you know, and well, well, or whatever. Sometimes but they I use have to the put battery in the, back uh, battery. The time. It doesn't know the time. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends on the processor that they used at the time. Uh, a lot of them used a little CMOS battery, similar to what uh, PCs used. When you turn them off, they, you know, they remember the time. There's a keep alive battery, yeah. Yeah, the keep alive battery. And so you, you, you may need to find out about it, uh, especially if it hasn't been used for a long time. Yeah. And here, here's a fun yeah, yeah. site to go to, to cloudynights.com. And there's so many discussions at cloudynights.com on how to do things and find out about different mounts and things and eyepieces. Really is a, a nice, uh, nice uh, lots of great information, I guess, in, in the cloudynights.com. 
Oh, okay. So, Thank you. Yeah, Tom, I sent you a. Oh. Tom, I sent you a picture of my uh, C8, and uh, in particular, you can see that I've added. You've already seen this, and I think, but uh, Joe probably hasn't. Uh, that I added a curved aluminum plate to the back casting that mounts were to existing holes that were there. So I didn't have to do any machining on the scope. And then that gave me the ability to uh, mount other things up there. So I have a laser pointer and a secondary, uh, that right there, and that secondary uh, uh, finder scope. And that laser pointer is just a lifesaver because, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to find what you're looking for because the field of view of the eyepiece is just small enough that you're screwed. But with a laser pointer, you can just move the scope over there. So it's point once you've collimated oh, the laser pointer. You, oh, you that, know, that, oh, that so that's right, Joseph. Did, um, did, did your scope come with a Telrad finder or um, a, or a, red, a, dot, uh, a yeah. red dot or anything like that? Probably, probably just came with the side scope like this and the CA. Yeah, yeah the, the one that this yeah. came with is a little orange scope that was on it. The one that's got yeah. the 90 degree is something I bought from Orion. Yeah, right, right. So uh, something like a red dot finder helps you dial it in really quickly um, because uh, as he, um, uh, they were alluded to, it's it's very narrow field of view and that gets you really close. In Mike, what I, what I do quite often is I take my green laser, you know, $12 from eBay or some laser place and I beam it through my finder <laughs> and that shows as, as long as I, I, I line my finder up with the, with the scope at some point with a bright star, get that lined up. After that, I can just beam my laser through here and, and know where I'm turning to yeah. if I'm doing something manually or, or just kind of shows me approximately uh, pretty closely where, where I'm at with just beaming a laser right. straight through your finder. I, I well, that's find that kind of, yeah. And if you really want to yeah. do it, you can, actually, you can actually beam your green laser right through the main eyepiece. <laughs> you just got to be careful oh, oh. you don't scratch your eyepiece. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good idea I, I, I recommend a green laser yep. I purchased well, a I got green. one of those powerful ones <laughs> yeah don't get the purple don't get the purple lasers from uh, DVD players those are really powerful blu-ray players those are very powerful the the tail red um how do you uh, it, it comes just with some uh, sticker tape to put on your telescope, but how do you get it mounted so it's perfectly aligned with your telescope? Well, you, you try and get it as well as you can. I mean, you, you eyeball it, and then um, there's adjustments on it that compensate for the fact that it's not properly uh, pointed at the same, the same way. Yeah, I use those. I use Telerad all the time. Um, the only modification I made is put a little cover over the top of it to keep the sun away from the uh, shining into the lens and burning out the reticle and also keeps yeah. the, uh, um, keep it from fogging up, you know, getting due. I've, okay. I've got a couple of those. Okay. Well, yeah, you, but you but red, dot, dot, red dot finders are, are good too. It's just that with Telrad, uh, the, the idea is the concentric circles allow you to find objects just because they're known distances from each other. It's sort of like half one degree and two degree, and there's charts to find things. But since you have a go-to scope, um, uh, that type of feature is not needed, but they're still pretty good as far as... Um, um, for your initial star alignment, because you do need it. Um, it, 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 that, that's the biggest pain of a go-to scope is getting your first star to align. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you know, can always... The problem with the Telrad is that whatever star, you know, it's just Murphy's law, whatever star you want to look at is in an inconvenient place for you to put your head. Yeah, that's where well... the, I'm serious. And that's where the, uh, the laser pointer just shines because it doesn't matter where it is in the sky. You're not having to bend your stand upside down and look through something. You just look where it's pointed. Yeah. And, yeah. and then with a the secondary finder scope that I put on there with a the elbow on it, it doesn't matter if it's overhead. I, I you know, you can turn the, uh, turn the uh, prism to, uh, to see what you want to see. 
Gotcha. Yeah. I have that on my six inch. That's a great little finder, by the way. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah. Well, that has a that has a lit up reticle on it, huh? Yeah. No, I really never ever use that. Oh, the other thing is when I do my alignment, and I'm looking in the my alignment eyepiece, which has got the crosshairs. I throw the scope out of focus, so the star that I'm looking at is a big donut. So it's easy to find, and the the star uh, diffused light lights up the reticle that's in the uh, in the uh, the alignment eyepiece, and it's oh. it's makes it a lot easier to center it. You're not trying to find this little dot of light. You're not a nice big uh, light, you know, a big donut, and you just center the donut. Take it out of focus, huh? No, I throw it way out of focus. And that also that also tells you if you're uh, collimated properly, right? And oh, that too. Yes, it sure does. So, so Joe, do you know do you know what collimation is? Where Joe go? Um, I, I'm here. I'm, I'm having to move to another room to um, charge my phone, so I walked into a dark hallway. Um, the uh, well, I remember seeing collimation done with reflector telescopes um but i don't know how that works with a with a smith cassegrain usually it's 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 not a not a problem once you've got it 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 pretty stays pretty steady for a long time uh but it does happen where they do do get out of collimation and and there's people put these what's called bobs knobs on the on their front uh, corrector plate uh, secondary mirror to have it tilt around to get collimation back. So it's something that could happen. If, if you find when you're out of focus with a star and it doesn't look like it's a, a perfect circle, then, like and you're, donut, you're it, yeah. an odd shaped donut, then you might have to do collimation. Hopefully, hopefully you won't have that problem, but yeah, we, we don't know. We need first light to be, uh, I think be happy to come down and, and help you get set up if you're willing to uh to take notes and uh and uh write down everything we're we're saying uh so you don't have to do it again <laughs> or well, collimation could, could come up to my place on a, on a night and i could show you how i set my scope up but it, it wouldn't be the same as having your direct uh unit though right um well i appreciate that um thank you what i will do is collimation um, shouldn't be uh arduous it's 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 picky and most you know you it, it's tiny adjustments tiny tiny adjustments because every time there are three screws up in the front that control the orientation of the secondary mirror mm -hmm. and if you tighten one you have to loosen another and it you know it just wobbles it around and so you'll look in your um in an eyepiece again with a telescope out of focus so you see a bright star like vega or something that is a big donut and at the center, and it should be in the middle of your field of view. And if the hole in that donut isn't uh, centered within the the, uh, the donut itself, then you're out of collimation. So okay. you go, you take your finger at the front of the scope as a as a uh, shadow, and you move it around to see where 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 is my finger with respect to the way this image is off. And then you go look at the screw that's nearest that, and you turn it an eighth of a turn. And you see whether it made it worse or better. Well, if it made it worse, then you take it back and try another one. But it doesn't take very long. It takes maybe 10 minutes to. Uh, uh, but, but the thing is, is that um, it, it, this, his scopes have not been used that much. So alignment may not, collimation may not be the issue right now. His main task, I believe now, is to figure out how to use the uh, the computer and uh, the alignment of okay. the scope with respect respect to yeah. finding objects. Yes, thank you. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's helpful to understand. The, um... Well, I, I have to tell you, when I when I first got my uh, C11 Edge, and you know, it was shipped, uh, I think, from OPT. And so I set it up and uh, first looked through it and Wow, the image looked like crap. <laughs> so what is this? <laughs> and so uh, what I discovered quickly is, even though it was brand new and sent to me, it was out of combination. So there's no guarantee 
we couldn't get jostled around in shipment and things happened to it. So, so uh, once I got accommodated, everything looked really good. And I breathed a big sigh of relief. So, man, this, this does not look good, <laughs> yeah, but that's all it needed. It needed to be accommodated. So. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll um, keep that in mind. Okay. So you said, uh, when you were talking about collimation, you said put your finger in front of the um Well, you're just aperture. trying to figure out which of the three screws do you need to make an adjustment. And right. you know, these are well, like what it looks like. But so I just uh -huh. take my finger and put it in front of the scope as a shadow, looking in the eyepiece. And then I move my hand around to say, try to figure out where is the, uh, you can see the middle, middle image up there at the top of all the little images. That's a badly collimated image, and you want to figure out what screw do I turn to center that. The, the donut in the middle is the uh, shadow of the secondary mirror. And okay. so you're trying to center it within the ring of the primary, uh, you know, the corrector plate, the primary mirror. Okay. And so it, it, it's just a, a, a gimmick that I use to, uh, to figure out which screw do I need to turn to try to get where I want to go. So once I make a decision, oh, it's, it's you know whichever one it is, you make a small adjustment, like an eighth of a turn, and okay. so you, and you then you can look in the eyepiece and did it make the uh, the uh, donut move more toward the middle or the the hole or did it work toward the edge? Well, it worked toward the edge. You turned the wrong thing. Turn it back an eighth of a turn. Go try a different one an eighth of a turn. And each okay. time you take one in an eighth of a turn, or let me a quarter of a turn, you've got to release one of the other ones. Because all they are is they're three screws that are operating on a metal plate that is to which the uh, secondary mirror is attached. And the middle okay. of that plate is on another screw that you can't see. It's the pivot. So every time you tighten one, you've got to loosen the other. So you can take this uh, um, the secondary mirror and rock it around so that it gets collimated with the primary mirror. Gotcha. All right. That's, hey Tom, that's, Tom, show him uh, a photo of a properly properly collimated SCT. What, get a photo here. What it, what the image looks like through the eyepiece when it's properly collimated. So well, this seems a little little detailed on this one. No, go back yeah. up. Go that's back up a little bit. A little bit more. There was a little bit right there. Stop. The one that oops. Okay, the seven 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 five seven nine. Yeah, see where yeah. The, the the donut is just about. It's a slightly off. Yeah. Okay, so okay. if that the black donut was to one side or another, would be out of alignment. Gotcha. Okay. So just get that that black donut right in the middle, and then you got a culminated scope. <laughs> okay. If you don't pop it, it'll stay limited. Yeah, as, as long as the screws are firm, somehow that they they don't feel loose, that'll that'll help keep them. In oh yeah, place. right, right down. If you stop the the finger in at the very middle, that shows the uh, the adjust right there. Yeah. Well, here, here's Bob. these That's Bob's done. Bob's knobs. Yeah. I've made my own. Oh, you know what you do is you go to um, like where we, or Joe and Drea, you go to the Shelly tool and uh, you take out one of the screws. It's not dangerous. You know, more than one is, things apart. And you go down to, you go to special tool and say, okay, I'm going to make a plastic head and it's true. So they'll go give you a, a, a capture, you know, with a, a, a Allen head. And they have these plastic uh, uh, that you push on top of it, and you hear one. It's that easy. One of the problems that you have with that is the no. uh, front corrector uh, will rest on that, and that's uh, really dangerous. Bruce, 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 you're breaking up again. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. Um, microphone's right here next to my mouth. Um, can you hear me? No, it, it it it's kind of breaking up, uh, you know, twenty percent breakage, so it makes it tough. Well, I basically know what Bruce was saying. He was saying if you go and get the, you find out what the screws are on your scope, 
you can go get knobs to fit those or they're they're press knobs that you can press into the screws but uh it's probably easier just to go through bob's knobs because they know exactly what screws are for the collimating the particular scope you have yeah all right so let me turn this maybe this is that any better i swiggled the uh connection mm, not quite no you can see right there uh the, the pivot point gotcha right okay so well, maybe that's, my that's, tablet computer is too close to my router they're only two apart it's overloading it got, got to get an apple ipad tablet i absolutely refuse to use apple equipment <laughs> You know, Joe, Joe, and if, if it's like the reflectors, when you collimate, what you're trying to do is you're trying to align the optical train. That's basically what you're doing. It, it, yeah. you, you really want the axis of your optical view to be in align with the, the, the middle of your, your main objective mirror and for it to come back precisely to the secondary. And then so that that's why when all these different uh, uh, defocus stars that they're talking about when when you see this defocus stars like you're seeing in this picture um, you're seeing the hole in the center and th that hole if it's not dead center then you're out of collimation they'll be off to one side they'll be pinched they'll be all, uh, kind of a, an oblong shape but basically once you play with those screws in the front I know what Bruce was trying to say but you can go to one screw turn it one way if it doesn't work, turn it back and then use another screw until you until you're seeing that it's making a difference in the image that you're looking at. Yeah. What you want okay. to end up with is is a is a very nice round hole in the center of a defocused star. Gotcha. Okay. That's but putting it. That's putting it. But that's I, really putting it simple. But, it, but that simplicity works. Yeah, but I would be and concerned about. The, uh, you're going to have to recenter the image in the eyepiece because it'll be off center. Yeah. 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 But again, this is for something for the future once he learns, understands exactly the right. menus. Uh, so I. Mike's right. He's, I think what you've got to do is first thing is set up the scope and then try to work on the hand paddle. We'll deal with collimation down the road. Okay. Yeah, I just. And then what? You will first be able to get an image. Joe, Joe, yeah. send send me an email when you're ready to play with your scope and set it up, and I'll see if I can't get down there and and, uh, and spread some COVID nineteen with you. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I appreciate that. That's nice. Okie dokie. <laughs> <laughs> By this the way, I had the, flu, I had the flu shot and the COVID booster. And uh, it knocked my wife for a loop for the uh, first day. I felt a little odd, but not too bad. It really didn't do much to me, but it did make you feel tired. It will make I'm, you feel tired. I'm glad you got it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's good. I keep running into people that are just, you know, going into a grocery store and they're crazy. You know, there's some kid walked out the other day and was starting to talk about, they're trying to force all these shots on us and just going off about how that's not freedom and man i just get in the car and go away and say you know god die <laughs> and all stopping at a stop sign isn't freedom either slowing down in a school zone that certainly impinges on your freedom yeah, I mean, yeah, this... yeah, yeah. well i bet you that kid probably had his whooping cough his polio that's right that's right his uh you measles, know, mumps, measles, and rubella. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Rubella. Yeah. But yep. I run, I run all of those. a host of people that just, they just uh, will not do it. Cool. Yeah. yeah. They drive yeah. me crazy. Yeah. Uh, now, the thing, what's okay, but, you know, this impinges on all the rest of us. Yeah. It isn't, it's, it's not just about you guys. <laughs> it's hard for some people to get. A notion that uh, life is more than about them. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a it's Point a real I, problem, yeah. real problem for the human being. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, I, Point I, I make that... with people when I'm walking around and I'm wearing a mask. It's your mask, and that just sets them. 
And I, yeah. you know, I don't care if you get the disease, if you, but you could be right now. You owe you know, it to the general population not to spread it. That's right. Yeah. And dying yeah. really impinges on your freedom. That's I right. A infection rate at a peak back in January. It isn't benign. Oh, yeah, yeah. And well, listen, that. Joe, it was very entertaining to hear all these. It was nice to, to hear a, a actual scope problem for one of our workshops. It's, it's, it, it's nice. It gets me back into getting all fired up about getting back into my scope building again. I really appreciate all of your help. It's oh, no, these guys very are very illuminating. Too. These guys and, are um, Mike did Mike did a fabulous job. Bruce, Tom, really fabulous yes. job. Next yeah, week. Yeah, let me know, Joe. Oh, what do you got there, Mike? What is that? Hold Next on. Next week uh, we'll talk about my interferometer. I got it all oh, yeah. together. You did it. Oh well. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you did it. Oh my God. The bath yeah. interferometer. That. Good for you. So maybe uh, next by next week I'll have a interferometer and I'll figure out the the software and be able to tell you uh, about it. I can't okay, believe Mike. you did it. I can't believe you did it. <laughs> Sounds good, Mike. Sounds good. Fantastic. Day. Fantastic. All right. I gotta uh, go, guys. We, we, okay. we can call it. Yeah, Joe, send me an email when you think you're ready to do it. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye, Good night. Good night, everybody. See you guys, night. Good night. See you guys night. later. Night. Stay cool night. in Arizona. <laughs> uh, no problem this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> this is a beautiful time of year here. Okay. Yeah, my daughter lives see, there. See you guys later. All right. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.